throughout the world, inequality is soaring to new heights. And the wealth of nations that once provided prosperity for the majority has gone missing. This is the story of powerful forces deepening the divide between the few and the many. Does Apple Inc. own directly or indirectly AOI, AOE, and ASI? Yes, Apple Inc. owns directly or indirectly AOI, AOE, and ASI. AOI is incorporated in Ireland, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it is incorporated in Ireland. And where is AOI a tax resident? It does not have a tax residency. We tend to imagine that the fiscal state has existed forever. We look at a political map in particular, we see those flat areas of colour with, with little black lines around them, and that's Britain or that's France, and we think that's existed for all time. And that linked to that territory is an economy, and that's the fiscal state. Within that territory we raise taxes, we distribute welfare, and we understand how that works. But of course it hasn't existed for all time. was a period before we had a welfare state. We had the welfare state under a certain set of conditions and those conditions have changed. For me, the history of the liberal state is the history of the middle class. You see, the middle class and those prosperous working classes that become this modest middle class, they were the big winners. It was their state. The elites didn't really need it. They needed it a bit. They used it a bit. This, 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 this was another world then. Huh? It was really a different epoch. decades of the liberal state, which is also a welfare state, I think they're gone, they're finished. This liberal state is in decay. So here are these middle classes revolting, the sons and daughters really, it's like a fourth or fifth generation after World War II, which suddenly finds this social contract is broken. Il est surprenant que 225 ans après la Révolution française, nous revenions au point de départ où il existe une classe importante de la société qui profite de privilèges fiscaux. La grande noblesse de l'époque ne payait pas d'impôts et aujourd'hui, nous voyons effectivement renaître une nouvelle grande noblesse qui, légalement, ne paie plus sa juste part d'impôts. À l'époque, Tout le fardeau fiscal reposait sur le tiers état. Et aujourd'hui, comme mère, je crains que nous soyons en train de préparer ce même destin pour nos enfants. Until our study in 2012, there was no uh, systematic estimate uh, for the size and growth of private wealth held through offshore havens. The global total was uh, astronomical. It was 21 to 32 trillion as of year end 2010, and it has uh, continued to grow since then. You know, we're talking about 10 to 15 percent of the world's uh, financial wealth basically being invested offshore beyond the reach of tax authorities. Tax Justice Network is, is and I mean, I know the guys who run it. They're fascinating people. I think they're misguided, but they're fascinating, and they're very well-intentioned in terms of they really believe in this stuff. But they're not 
Tax Justice Network doesn't have a huge staff of trained economists like the OECD or the IMF. And I put the question to a former deputy director of the IMF just last year. You've got 3,000 economists between the World Bank and the IMF. I can't find any literature on tax havens. Why is that? He said, you know, it's very simple. Several of the most important tax havens are our members. To understand the relationship between the city of London and the metropolis of London, you need to understand a little bit of the history. When William I came to Britain from Normandy, the French king, to conquer the rest of the country, he stopped at the gate of the city of London. He never finished the job. The French never finished the job. And the city, maintained the rights and privileges that had existed in King Edward's day. Many of the things the monarch gave us protected us, so we could uh, restrict trade uh, to whoever we wanted to. I mean, today, you would actually probably be in a, a court defending it as a, as a cartel or something, but that, that was the way it was, of course. We own all the bridges we, across the Thames, though over the years, from taking tolls over the bridges, we've built up quite a substantial amount of money there, which we use for the benefit of the nation. But one of the primary is to um, protect, not protect, protect, promote the, the London's financial services on a global basis. The square mile of the City of London retains all the ancient rights and privileges and resources of the ancient City of London. And that the people who live outside the square mile, those eight million of which I'm one, don't share in those resources, uh, although we are citizens of London. Yeah, so this is the city. We use this for planning, showing that it's interactive, you can find out where you want to be. So we own about 25% of the city, the corporation. But I say there's now more foreign investors own the city than domestic. And that what you have today, you have this institution that promotes the singlest interest of finance capital. It's using this huge network of resources to promote the single issue of finance capital. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a travesty of its history. We do produce an awful lot of money. What's good for the city is good, good for the country, providing, providing that that money is earned fairly and squarely and doesn't jeopardise uh, the wealth of the nation, which it has done. So, you know. Nobody, in my view, has the right to pitch the tent on a public highway and stay there and decide and tell the authorities when they might wish to leave. And I went there because at that time I felt there was nobody putting up the case. They wanted to, to abolish the city corporation and everything else. I thought, well, I'll go there and I'll try and have a debate. The financial services industry, it produces about 65 billion in taxes, 35 billion in uh, overseas surplus. It's been very successful because, apart from anything else, many of the other industries, of course, that used to be very successful in Britain, have withered away. And I don't make any apologies for being successful. I don't make any apologies for being number one in the world. 
So far from being a success story, I regard the City of London as the world's biggest tax haven, attracting billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of wealth out of Africa, out of Asia, out of Latin America, out of Europe, out of Greece, out of Italy, to where it's misused by the City of London. Stuart, I would welcome it if quite a few of our bankers left as quickly as possible. More or less a half of the whole global offshore system is in some way British, particularly the, the, the Crown dependencies and overseas territories. And these are, in a sense, fragments of the British Empire. After the Second World War, particularly, you had a very rapid phase of decolonization. Of, uh, you know, the British Empire effectively collapsed. And uh, just at that moment, you had the birth of a new market in London. The, the so-called euro markets or euro dollar markets, which was essentially a, an unregulated um, market for, um, uh, for dollars. When the Bank of England made a decision to allow dollars to be traded um, outside of the Federal Reserve, uh, because of a quirk of British law, it didn't have to define where it was to be traded. All, it ma all that mattered was that it was no longer to be traded through the uh, New York banking system. By not defining where trades were to take place, effectively, it meant that the trades were taking place, depending on how you understand it, anywhere or nowhere. The Bank of England basically deemed this transaction as if they don't take place in London. But since they don't take place in London, then London doesn't regulate this transaction. But then, Nobody else can regulate this transaction because they actually takes place in London. The result is they created an offshore market which is unregulated. By the 1960s, the large American banks grasped and began to understand that actually by operating through London, they can avoid all sorts of regulation and the market exploded. C'est la première fois que des banquiers géraient aussi massivement de la liquidité euh, libellée dans une devise qui n'était pas celle de leur pays. Depuis Londres, ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'on a en quelque sorte réparti ce, ce, cette manne, hein, ces, ces milliards de dollars américains là qui ne relevaient euh, plus du gouvernement américain euh, dans différents paradis fiscaux, dont notamment les Caïmans, l'île Georges et ainsi de suite. Bon, euh, donc on s'est retrouvé face à hein, ce qu'on a appelé la planète financière. Hein. Cette planète financière, c'est-à-dire ces, 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 ces gestionnaires de capitaux, ces titulaires de capitaux capables d'agir à l'échelle internationale sans être encadrés par quelque législation que ce soit. The poor Canadian banks also wanted to take advantage of London, but London is expensive. And somebody hit on the idea, I don't know whom, but it was somebody in the Bank of Nova Scotia, for what I understand, hit on the idea that in fact, because Cayman Island is part of the British, is, is, is a dependency of the British state, it's subject to the same law as London. On learned in the 60s, Donald Fleming, who, for the account of the Scotia Bank, travailed at Euh, élaborer des lois en matière fiscale pour euh, les Bahamas. Le ministre des Finances et du Tourisme est en même temps membre du Conseil d'administration de la Banque royale du Canada. Et un peu plus tard, aux îles Caïmans, on a en euh, Jim McDonald, un avocat d'affaires proche du Parti conservateur, qui lui conseille les Caïmans pour qu'ils blindent le secret bancaire en vigueur chez eux. It has been said by an English jurist that it's uh, the right of every Englishman to so arrange his affairs that the tax department doesn't put the largest possible shovel into his stores. Uh, I agree with that. And in Calgary, I was fortunate enough that um, the income tax uh, I was paying is exceeded 50%. I was working very hard, long hours. I wasn't seeing my family. And I just, I just essentially refused to pay more than half of my income to government. And so I started looking for someplace else. There's 
nothing, to my mind, uh, improper, immoral, or anything else about establishing a tax haven. I don't feel any remorse about not paying taxes. I think it's a marvelous way of life. Donc, on a en le Canada un pays qui est tout à fait engagé dans la transformation euh, des euh, législations britanniques des Caraïbes en paradis fiscaux. Ce sera mod bon, euh, efficace, moderne, adapté à la finance mondiale. The Bahamas started life as a UK OFC, but it became independent in the 1970s. Bermuda is still a, a, an overseas territory. The Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, Jersey, the Isle of Man, Guernsey. So you had this kind of two-stage replacement for the empire. The city was suddenly reinvigorated and it started growing very fast again. And all these countries that had decolonized, as well as many others, um, because they still looked to the mother country for sort of the rule of law and, you know, financial trading, the money started coming back through this system, through the city, through the euro markets and through the, 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 the tax havens. And that mixed up with money from, from you know, presidents and their families and their cronies looting their countries and all that money washed into the system and all the players in the system very quickly realized that you know the more questions we ask about the, the origin of this money the less money we're going to get so you know very quickly this mentality developed um, that you know this, this ask no questions mentality we just like the money <laughs> is that money effectively crosses the border in one direction only. It leaves the country that issued it, the country that guarantees it, and it enters this global financial space, this space of money. It isn't a real space. You can't visit it. We can't get on a bus and go there. But your money can, and your money can travel the world through these markets without landing anywhere. And it can do so in perpetuity, should you so wish. Um, and so the, the space of money, it's quite hard to conceive of a space of money. Imagine a, a, a bit like cloud computing. We call it the cloud because we think of it as hovering above us and carrying all our data uh, 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 in a way that's quite comfortable. We kind of, kind of quite like the idea of the cloud. Offshore finance created cloud money long before we had cloud computing. Offshore is about leaving legal space. And so for that reason, offshore resides on the other side of the map, as it were. You can penetrate through the map into this rather undefined domain that we call offshore. We use this familiar topographical language as though it was simply somewhere else uh, on the surface of the earth. But of course, it's somewhere else legally, somewhere else fiscally. Hurricane Ivan hit the Cayman Islands. I think the most noticeable thing that happened was that a few light aircraft left the islands beforehand with computer hard drives on them. So effectively, Cayman Island can be destroyed by a hurricane. In fact, Cayman Island can be submerged under the sea and can remain the fourth largest financial center world. There are $1.6 trillion book to Cayman Islands banks. Almost none of that is actually in Cayman or invested in Cayman or in a chest in, on the beach. That money is, flows but mostly between banks or between major corporations. 
and is reinvested somewhere else. Moi, j'ai rencontré, c'est une histoire que je raconte, elle est amusante, enfin, demi-amusante. Un jour, dans un colloque international, euh, on me dit, ah, vous savez que dans la conférence, il y a le gouverneur de la banque centrale des Bahamas. Je me dis, ça, c'est intéressant. On connaît le, le rôle du des Bahamas dans le système financier, bien, et donc euh, je, je me présente à lui, un vieux monsieur très distingué, et je lui dis, ah, gouverneur de la Banque Centrale, c'est évidemment très important compte tenu de la place de la finance dans la vie économique des Bahamas. Il me dit, oh, vous savez, moi, j'ai jamais fait de finance dans ma vie, jamais. Euh, alors je dis, ah oui, mais quand même, comme gouverneur, euh, vous avez une fonction de, de surveillance, de contrôle sur les banques, sur les, les marchés. Il me dit, pas du tout, pas du tout, je n'ai aucun moyen d'action. Nothing real is really happening in these places. Um, you don't get very much real management of... Um, Uh, you know, hedge funds, the real people who are doing real stuff are in New York or London or Paris or wherever. And the famous joke in London goes as follows. Those who know don't talk about these things. Those who talk don't know. I got a job working for what is now Deloitte Touche in their offshore operations. The next step was one day in my office, the phone went and there was a company acting on behalf of the government of Jersey. They said, you're an economist and the government wants an economic advisor. Are you interested in applying for the job? And there I was, an insider in a very prominent European tax haven which meant that I was in a very, very good position to start finding out what the UK's position was on its crown dependencies. The British government con connived at every single step in supporting its offshore tax havens like Jersey and the Cayman Islands and so on. Far from wanting to take action, they were under pressure from the European Union or from the United States. They would talk the talk about, yeah, we'll do what we can but they never really took any effective action. So it allowed the enormous growth of the financial capital, um, and that, in the end, had the result of, you know, you had the Americans, for example, saying, all this activity is happening in London, there's nothing we can really do to stop it. What do we do now? You know, uh, we're being undermined here, do we, you know, we, if we can't beat them, maybe we should join them. Politicians felt they had to somehow compete with this unregulated market by relaxing their own regulations. Politicians began to change the discourse, the language. It was no longer about spiritual growth, education, and so on and so forth, being part of a group, but it's about providing economic growth. The role of the state became to become more competitive in the world market. It became the competition state. And so states had to respond by compromising with the corporation, basically provided them sweeteners, subsidies, lower taxation, but at the same time providing them with a highly educated workforce with political stability. I think the problem is that many politicians have an illusion that they actually run their country, when actually they run their country within the confines that the global financial system places on them. 
So if you want to take action on the UK economy, if Mr Carney comes in and he wants to spend a fortune of money, he'll find that the international financiers will look at him and say, you're not. Otherwise, we're going to sell all of your government bonds. For me, this so-called competitive um, dynamic is perhaps the most important reason why we have seen the dismantling of the welfare state, cutting taxes on the most mobile forms of income, which means raising taxes on uh, less mobile for forms of income, which tends to represent you know, workers and poorer people, and um, uh, you know, making it much harder for the wealth welfare state to, 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 to function, and one of the great reasons for the huge rise in inequality that we've seen in the world today, particularly at the very top of the income scale. On peut suivre assez précisément l'évolution des, des inégalités de revenus, de la répartition du revenu national américain de 1913 jusqu'en 2013. Ce qui est très frappant, c'est qu'on a vraiment deux phases. Une phase de très forte diminution des inégalités de revenus entre les années 1910, 1920 et les années 1950. Une stabilisation dans les années 1950, 1960, 1970 avec un niveau d'inégalité plus faible qu'auparavant. Et puis, depuis les années 70, on a une très forte hausse qui nous ramène pratiquement au point de, au point de départ. Ce qui, est, ce qui est très frappant dans cette histoire, c'est le fait qu'on a, on a une histoire qui est euh, intrinsèquement euh, économique et politique. C'est-à-dire que si on essaye d'expliquer ces courbes avec des facteurs purement économiques, technologiques, on n'y arrive pas. C'est-à-dire que l'histoire du XXe siècle, elle est quand même très fortement marquée euh, par les guerres mondiales, par les grands revirements politiques induit non seulement par les guerres mondiales, mais par la crise de 29, euh, par la révolution euh, conservatrice des années euh, 70-80, notamment aux États-Unis et au Royaume-Uni. We must alter our course. The taxing power of government must be used to provide revenues for legitimate government purposes. It must not be used to regulate the economy or bring about social change. What begins to happen in the 1980s is that transformation that comes with the globalizing, the opening up, the possibility of offshoring. So that instead of having a protected economy that allowed all this system to work in a certain direction, now, and, and ironically, of course, partly because of the victories of of syndicalism in many of these countries, you know, and the claims, the successful claims of modest middle class people in bureaucracies to have health insurance, to have retirement funds, you know, to have housing subventions, to have public transport, public education, public, you know, a lot of public services. Because that succeeded so well, I think, the onslaught that begins in the 1980s on all those costs, as they were called, is so brutal. The state collaborated, the corporate actors worked hard at it, so it was an actively made destruction of those circuits that the state had used to bring back to the mass of the people some benefits from the taxes that they paid. We can go back to the Thatcher era in Britain. Uh, government spending grew very rapidly in the governments before Mrs. Thatcher from World War II, and the British economy stagnated and was getting a bit, rich were getting poorer and poorer. Mrs. Thatcher understood the problem. Same thing happened here in America under Ronald Reagan, a lot of other countries around the world. Things were privatized, uh, governments were cut back, great results. <music> Would you say that one of the ways companies meet their obligations to society is through the payment of tax, yes or no? I think uh, payment of tax is an important responsibility of businesses, yes. Could you tell me how many subsidiary companies your group uses and are incorporated in the Isle of Man? 
I don't have that number with me. I'd be happy to look into it. And well, according back. to the return that your group company put in last year, you have 30 subsidiaries operating in that jurisdiction. Can you tell me how many subsidiary companies you have operating in Jersey? Uh, I don't have that number with me either. The number is 38. Can you tell me how many subsidiary companies of your group are incorporated and operating in the Cayman Islands? Same answer. You have 181. Now, of course, all of these are well-known tax havens which are used by companies, and a cursory reading of your group return shows that you have over 300 such companies operating in tax haven jurisdictions around the world. You will understand, Mr Diamond, that there's obviously, I mean, if you look at the facts I've just presented, that would suggest that your bank is engaged on tax avoidance on a grand scale, would it not? Well, I don't know what you would... I think tax evasion is a very clear phrase, and it's a space we would never know, go to. And I didn't use the word. And I, I chose the word tax efficiency, which is our obligation, and it's something that is in line with government policy. But your efficiency may be our avoidance. Those corporations have brilliant lawyers, brilliant accountants. Why bother with being illegal, like your average little household might be, illegally avoiding certain tax? Why bother with illegality? You can navigate that regulatory fracture, as I call it, that space in between legal and illegal. Évidemment que les paradis fiscaux et les planifications fiscales de plus en plus agressives sont un problème, mais le plus important problème, l'essence même du problème, c'est la concurrence fiscale devenue destructrice entre les pays. Si on prend l'approche du Canada face aux paradis fiscaux, on remarque une certaine forme de ségrégation en deux catégories de contribuables. D'une part, il y a les multinationales pour qui c'est devenu légal de payer aucun impôt sur les revenus qu'elles réalisent ou prétendent réaliser dans les paradis fiscaux. Et de l'autre côté, on voit la mise en place de mesures d'enquête extrêmement contraignantes et corsées pour coincer et punir tous les autres contribuables qui essaieraient de faire de même. Here's the situation. You've got an agreement which shifts the economic rights into the most valuable thing you have to three Irish companies that pay no taxes. You point out, and accurately so, Mr. Cook, that 95% of the creativity that goes into those products is in California, but two-thirds of the profits are in Ireland. And you've made a decision, which you have a right to do, not to bring that money home. Senator, we're proud that all of our R&D, or the vast majority of it, is in the United States. I know, but about 70% of the profits worldwide now end up with those three Irish corporations. That's the facts. The sort of headline with Ireland has got this 12.5% tax rate. Now, that's not really where the offshore action is. I mean, that's significant for sure. But what Ireland does is it um, allows multinationals, it deems only a very small amount of the profits that they make there to be taxable. The double Irish is part of the whole transfer pricing game. It is a way of uh, one of the um, names given to one of the techniques for, for um, disregarding large amounts of income and only taxing a small proportion of that. Well, this is my take on the double Irish. Uh, they might do something like mix a Guinness with a champagne. Half shot of Baileys, half shot of whiskey. This is possibly a drink that may curdle. That's why you have to drink it fast. A shot of Malibu first, followed by a shot of Jameson. There's your double Irish. Shot of Malibu, shot of Jameson, all the way down to the Caribbean and back to Dublin. That's a double Irish for you. So I'll taste it, see what it's like. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> no. Tastes like a gone off Guinness. 
So the likes of Microsoft, Google, and these other big companies, corporate companies, I believe they do pay taxes. They pay taxes to their employees. So their employees are paying taxes into the country. And it's also, um, on a positive note, it's keeping people upbeat, it's keeping people in work, and it's saving saving a lot of people from being on the social welfare. It's a double-edged sword. Like, for the people that I know that work for them, they're providing them with employment, so it comes down to whether you're thinking of it, you know, your, your, you and your little unit are the greater consciousness of people out there. And if the option is be a part of it and feed your kids and, you know, pay your mortgage or, you know, take the moral high ground, because I don't know too many people who can afford to take the moral high ground. I think the corporations coming to Ireland to avoid paying massive taxes, just kind of a a showcase of how short-sighted government is here. Everything's been just like, make money now, don't think about the future, and that's been the scenario, even through the Celtic Tiger in Ireland when it was doing really well. People didn't invest money into services. I mean, you look at the state of the roads here, the most basic thing, and there's potholes everywhere, and you can just tell that there's been so much corruption with how money's been spent, and people pay really high tax here. And Personally, like property tax they're introducing, water tax, all these new taxes, personal taxes. You could probably see why maybe the, the bigger companies are coming to this country because the tax for them isn't as high. So our multi-million dollar companies that are making millions aren't getting taxed as much, whereas the kind of people that have the lower income or the average income are just taxes are going through the roof. These companies, it, as soon as a tax is introduced, like they're not committed to Ireland, they'll be gone. And the politicians know that and they're playing that gamble, but it's really destroying the economy here, I think. And it's setting a really bad example to people that, you know, oh, if you provide jobs, you can just get away with whatever you want, so. Many studies have shown that when countries offer tax competition as a way to attract jobs, companies will take advantage of the subsidies that the countries provide. And when another country offers a different subsidy, they will pack up and move to those countries. The real jobs that these tax competition creates, in my view, are jobs for tax lawyers and tax accountants. When multinational companies have subsidiaries in many different countries around the world, as you know, anything that can be priced can also be mispriced. But let's take agriculture as an example. Let's say bananas. Now, many of the plantations in Guatemala are owned by the big fruit companies in the world, Del Monte and Chiquita. They have plantations in Guatemala. It's sold at a very low price to a company in the Cayman Islands. So what happens is the plant is grown, the fruit is grown in Guatemala. The revenue that the government of Guatemala collects is minimal. The actual profit sits when the fruit is sold to Cayman Islands from where it is resold to Europe and the United States. In the course of our study in Guatemala, we found that as a result of this trade mispricing, Guatemala was losing about $500 million a year through this underpricing of exports and overpricing of imports. $500 million a year in a country that is so poor. And, and as we got into more studies in this area, we calculated that developing countries as a whole were losing about $200 billion a year. You know, the comment that was made by Joseph Andrews, who is uh, the head of the transfer pricing at the OECD, he made a very interesting, very revealing comment in February when he said that, that there's something wrong with the global trading system if 75% of the profits of multinational companies are deemed to be earned in four tax haven countries, Switzerland, Singapore, Bermuda and Cayman Islands.
Now, Amazon, I buy a book from you. Uh, I do it actually online. I'm a regular buyer. And when I buy a book, what I do is I get... In company, we operate a single European... No, I'm, I'm buying, it says, it says to me, I'll show it to you, it says Amazon.co.uk. Is, um, is, that, is that actually to, to lie to me about the origins of your company? No, we're running uh, a, a single European uh, business. It comes with a UK, I, am, I believe I'm dealing with a UK company. The chair buys her book, the money comes to Luxembourg, and you just essentially pay a small amount back to the UK to have it delivered, is that? Services such as operating the, the, the fulfilment centres, which is going to be receiving inventory, picking, packing, uh, and, and then passing on those products. How much of your Luxembourg business is sales into the UK? Mm. Uh, fortunately, uh, we've never broken out uh, figure, revenue figures on a country or website basis. I give you can't be serious. We, we, we operate a, a pan-European business. Those are the only only figures we have ever broken. I used to be a finance director of a pan-European business, and if somebody told me what do you ask me what do you sell in each country, I'd be fired immediately if I didn't have the answer to that question. That's so the, 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 those are numbers that, that we we've never disclosed uh, publicly. Um, Will you disclose them privately? I, I'm very happy, should, should the committee wish, to, 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 to come back and see whether it's possible to disclose them privately to the committee. directeur de la Direction des Vérifications Nationales et Internationales qui est en charge en France du contrôle fiscal des grandes entreprises. Je suis chef donc d'un service des consultants, service des consultants qui comprend 16 personnes. Et nous on va essayer de déterminer si la société n'a pas manipulé ses prix de transfert entre chaque pays afin de minimiser sa base imposable. Dans mon métier, ce qui est le, le plus complexe, c'est de pouvoir dépasser dans les montages l'apparence juridique pour aller vraiment sur l'économie. Et essayer de comprendre vraiment le groupe dans son ensemble pour pouvoir déterminer si euh, il y a une juste répartition du profit entre chaque pays. Parce que souvent dans ces grands groupes, ils ont tendance à présenter la situation comme quoi les entités qui sont situées en France ne réalisent que des prestations annexes d'une valeur très faible, alors qu'en fait, c'est les sociétés qui sont localisées en France qui ont la relation avec la clientèle. C'est elles qui, la plupart du temps, qui vont négocier les contrats. Quand on prend chaque pays, c'est légal. Après, ce qui peut être un peu moins légal, et d'autant moins moral, euh, c'est l'articulation de ces différents régimes pour aboutir au résultat d'une imposition nulle, voire quasi nulle. Il faut savoir ce qui se passe au-delà de nos frontières. Or, une administration fiscale n'est compétente qu'à l'intérieur de ces frontières. Les échanges d'informations internationaux, c'est à la demande. On ne peut pas se contenter de, de demander ces informations à la société. D'ailleurs, elle ne nous les donnerait probablement pas. Donc s'il y avait évidemment des échanges automatiques d'informations, ça nous faciliterait la tâche. Alors je dirais qu'on ne peut pas être, euh, je ne sais pas si l'image va parler, mais le, le village d'Astérix euh, qui tout seul va résister aux Romains euh, euh, multinationales. Bien entendu, la, la coopération entre les pays est très importante. L'impôt sur les sociétés, typiquement l'impôt sur les bénéfices des sociétés, ne, ne, ne peut plus être prélevé euh, séparément par les 27 euh, pays de l'Union européenne. Au minimum, les, les pays de la zone euro, l'Allemagne, la France, l'Italie, la Belgique, l'Espagne doivent se mettre ensemble pour prélever leur impôt sur les sociétés avec une déclaration unique, une assiette unique, faute de quoi il n'y aura tout simplement plus d'impôt sur les sociétés à l'horizon de, 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 de 10 ou 20 ans. Dans un ordre où le principe des droits et des devoirs ne s'applique plus qu'à la classe moyenne et aux prolétaires, mais pas aux détenteurs de fortune et aux entreprises qui peuvent toujours enregistrer une activité ou des opérations dans une législation qui va louer complaisamment son droit pour permettre à ses acteurs d'agir indépendamment de toute contrainte, on peut dire que la démocratie devient une sorte de farce parce qu'elle ne s'applique plus qu'aux mêmes et elle permet aux plus puissants enfin, d'échapper à toute contrainte. Et c'est le sens même de l'État qui se dissipe 
dans cette, euh, on va dire, dans cette logique mondiale des paradis fiscaux. Comme toute compagnie, nous sommes obligés de faire deux choses. Une, de jouer par les règles. Et quand vous êtes international, vous devez faire des décisions sur comment protéger votre propriété internationale et comment vous organiser. Et en deuxième lieu, de gérer vos coûts suffisamment pour satisfaire nos shareholders. Et notre objectif est de faire des taxes, même si c'est injuste aux taxes taxpayers. Ce n'est pas injuste aux taxes britanniques. Nous payons tous les taxes que vous nous demandez de payer dans le UK. Nous avons payé 6 millions de taxes l'année dernière. Nous ne vous accusons pas d'être illégal, nous vous accusons d'être immoral. Nous vous accusons d'être immoral. The fair share argument, I think, is a really, really difficult one to run, particularly for someone from a legal background. And, and it's sort of the buzzword, Apple isn't paying its fair share or Starbucks isn't paying its fair share. The, 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 and OFCs are not the villains in that debate. The debate is if you think the domestic US tax structure is wrong and that Apple should be paying US tax on the 150 billion that it has outside the US, change domestic U.S. tax laws to have that happen. Lorsque le Québec a annoncé durant les dernières années qu'il avait l'intention d'augmenter l'impôt des grandes richesses, on a ressenti dans les bureaux de comptables une réaction presque instantanée. Les riches avaient vraiment l'intention de partir. Donc, sans réelle coopération fiscale internationale, une juridiction comme le Québec ne peut pas faire cavalier seul sans se faire brandir la menace d'exil. Unless we deal with the global industry as such, you know, we're not going to really address this problem um, uh, anywhere uh, nearly as effectively as we need to. And uh, all the players in this industry are basically organized across borders. Uh, if you look at Apple and Google and Microsoft and Facebook and the big pharmaceutical companies, uh, the multinationals, the grain companies that are uh, using their tax <laughs> lawyers and their accounting firms, Uh, to uh, park assets in low-tax jurisdictions. Um, you know, they're playing this game across borders. I think we have to organize effectively around these global industries uh, the same way. Les États sont souverains, on ne pourra jamais changer ça. Et donc, il faut qu'ils se parlent, il faut qu'ils échangent, et il faut qu'ils aient des règles sur lesquelles ils se mettent d'accord. C'est ça le principal défi, qu'on réécrive les règles de zéro aujourd'hui ou alors qu'on adapte les règles existantes. Et tout ceci est possible seulement si tous les pays s'y mettent. Et une fois qu'ils s'y sont tous mis, ils se surveillent les uns les autres. Donc on peut enfin enclencher ce qu'on appelle un cercle vertueux. The offshore world is full of vibrant, intelligent and creative people. They are used to adapting to thrive and survive, and they will continue to do that. Uh, there is no doom or gloom. Uh, conversely, everybody I've met uh, appears to be optimistic. If we are now talking about tax avoidance being bad, uh, that is a significant shift in the nature of the playing field. Uh, the particularly active players are, of course, the OECD in terms of the tax field. And the current um, head of the tax division, who's a Frenchman, needless to say, called Pascal Saint-Amand, who, by the way, doesn't pay any tax on his OECD salary, but people get tired of me saying that. Uh, he gave a fascinating speech at the side uh, Oxford University Business School um, in the middle of April in wonderful Gallic fashion. He had three, three days of beer and it was wonderful, a silver fox. Depuis 50 ans, l'OCDE travaille à éliminer les doubles impositions. Le problème qui est survenu au cours des 20 dernières années avec la globalisation, c'est qu'on est passé de l'élimination de la double imposition à l'organisation de la double non-imposition. Ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire que les entreprises ne payent plus leurs impôts nulle part. Et c'est un problème grave auquel on est confronté aujourd'hui et que l'on veut traiter. Et il a basically dit, oui, nous reconnaissons que c'est une opportunité pour l'OECD de prendre le contrôle de la politique taxe globale. Les bases fiscales, c'est-à-dire les profits, en fait, sont réduits artificiellement. Et ce sur quoi euh, on se bat, c'est mettre fin au divorce qu'il y a entre la localisation des activités Là où vous avez les gens qui développent une marque, qui développent un produit, et la localisation du profit, qui est juste une société où il n'y a personne. Et dans le monde commercial, la façon dont c'est accompli, c'est par 
creating intellectual property, this is patents and copyrights and the like, and then placing those pieces of intellectual property in the offshore world, and then billing the onshore companies for the use of what has been patented or copyrighted. So, for example, the name Starbucks might be uh, copyrighted and uh, trademarked, and now the trademark is sold to some offshore shell company, and everywhere in the world there's a Starbucks, they'll pay for the use of the name. But that moves the profit to a place where there's no tax. Et donc, il faut mettre fin à ça. Il faut réconcilier l'endroit où se passent les activités et l'endroit où doivent être taxées les activités. Are we helping developed nations or are we helping emerging nations uh, and attempting to reduce or alleviate poverty? Uh, or are we actually maintaining financial imperialism? And uh, I, I'm afraid I tend to the former, not the latter. Within the OECD membership, there are going to be some countries that will do everything possible to prevent them from moving forward to, to what should be the logical outcome, which is to move towards taxing companies, not on the basis of the legal fictions they create in the Cayman Islands and the Channel Islands, but on the basis of where their genuine economic activity takes place. Do you tax corporations as if they were a collection of separate entities loosely interacting with each other. And, you know, when they put those entities in different tax havens and jurisdictions around the world, um, do you accept those, you know, the legal form of the corporation as the basis for taxing them? Um, or do you take a completely different philosophical view of what multinational corporation is and treat it as a single global unit, and then you decide where it's doing business, where it real business is, it's, you know, its sales, its, its, its payroll and so on, where is the real business of that corporation? And then you allocate its global profits to each jurisdiction. You divide it up to each jurisdiction according to the real economic substance of what they're doing. If you do it that way, then you can completely ignore what the tax havens are doing. They can do whatever they like in tax havens, but if there's no real economic activity, they will get allocated a tiny proportion of the global income, and it doesn't matter if they tax that at 0%. What's different about Google versus the other businesses you've been talking about, we're not selling books and we're not... Uh, making You're coffee. Advertising we're, we're, well, the services we provide to consumers are based on the computer science. That is what creates the economic uh, value uh, for what Google. What does Bermuda create? S'intéresser à à la réalité physique de, de l'économie numérique, c'est-à-dire à ces serveurs sur lesquels du code est exécuté et des données sont émergées, euh, bah, c'est s'exposer à ce que tout disparaisse au-delà des frontières et, et dans les nuages. Et c'est pour ça qu'il faut renverser le raisonnement et chercher un autre point d'ancrage euh, sur le territoire. Le droit fiscal n'est pas du tout préparé à, à, au rôle actif que jouent désormais les consommateurs finaux dans la création de valeur. Euh, puisque jusqu'ici, il résonne au contraire sur une séparation stricte. Il y a la création de valeur, puis la monétisation par la vente. Et aujourd'hui, l'activité spontanée de ces utilisateurs et, le, et les flux de données que cette activité génère, ça représente un actif dont ces entreprises font levier pour euh, créer encore plus de valeur et générer euh, du chiffre d'affaires et d'énormes bénéfices. What's happening with the internet, the basic internet was like that, but what's happened with it recently with the advent of the advertising business model and cloud computing and the way that everybody gives their data over to remote companies, it's, it's as if you just, you got on, you got your truck on the freeway and then the, the freeway supplied people who would recommend the route and would decide which truck stop you would be aware of. The highway system is generous. Uh, obviously, we pay for it with our taxes, but once we use it, it doesn't try to manipulate us. The Internet has been very different. The Internet has asked us to give all of our information to it in order to do anything. And this is a terrible idea because the information is the power.
So people have to understand when they get these sort of free services like free search or free social networking, what they're really doing is they're giving over the true value, which is the data about themselves and their friends that can be used to drive these behavioral models that then can be used to concentrate fortunes. They're giving away the stuff that's really valuable. And what they're getting is trinkets. They're, 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 they're putting themselves in the position of lesser citizens who can't really bargain, can't, don't really have first class status in the economy anymore. Dès l'apparition d'Internet dans les années 90, on a tout de suite identifié que ça pouvait devenir un nouveau canal de distribution pour des biens, des biens physiques. Et il s'est ouvert tout un tas de sites web, sur lesquels, on, de boutiques en ligne, sur lesquelles on pouvait aller faire ses courses. Euh, beaucoup d'entreprises ont tenté leur chance, peu ont, ont réussi à, à s'en sortir durablement, et aujourd'hui, une seule, Amazon, domine très largement ce marché. Et la raison pour laquelle Amazon domine ce marché, c'est parce qu'ils ont recueilli, collecté beaucoup de données, euh, toutes les traces que nous laissons quand nous visitons la boutique. Et si Amazon s'en sort mieux que les autres, c'est parce qu'Amazon est celle qui a su le mieux exploiter cette activité spontanée euh, qui est la nôtre dans une boutique. I mean, the books are here, the warehouses are here, the billing is here, the business is here, the customers are here. We have paid uh, in excess of 100 million uh, in payroll taxes uh, in the fast, last five years. We've paid uh, tens of millions in business rates uh, in the past five years. And I've heard this argument before. Let me just kill this argument because it really makes me cross. On the one hand, so does every other business. So the community-based uh, bookshop that you're putting out of business also pays business rates, also pays its PAYE, also pays V, actually probably pays VAT in a way that you don't, and, and uh, you uh, in the same way, and you're making it uncompetitive. And the other thing is you depend on the services that come out of the tax you pay. So, you know, you depend on the ability of your, uh, of, of, of getting your goods around, so you've got to get the truck, the roads in place, you depend on all those things. And probably worst of all, both you and Mr. Alsted employ people on probably minimum wage, if we're lucky, and then we, the taxpayer, pick up the tax credit bill for that too. So we're putting a lot of money back into the people you, you, you put, and you're not putting enough tax into our economy. That's what's riding us all. Et donc, voilà, pour, pour toute une série de raisons, l'économie numérique ne paye pas d'impôts dans les, dans les États où elle a la majorité de ses utilisateurs. Et donc, ça crée une situation complètement nouvelle, c'est que des entreprises meurent sous l'effet de cette révolution industrielle et cessent de payer des impôts. Et puis, la marge se déplace vers les, des entreprises dont les bénéfices sont déclarés à l'étranger ou thésaurisés dans des paradis fiscaux. Et donc, la seule manière de mettre fin à ce processus euh, vicieux et dangereux, c'est de refonder le droit fiscal pour lui permettre d'appréhender la façon nouvelle de créer de la valeur dans l'économie numérique. C'est de considérer que la valeur se concentre à l'intérieur des organisations et s'ouvrir à l'idée que, parce qu'on est dans l'économie numérique, la valeur est aussi créée par les utilisateurs, qui ne sont plus seulement des consommateurs finaux qui payent, mais des, des agents actifs de la création de valeur. Parce que par ailleurs, dans cette économie numérique, il y a de moins en moins de, de machines et de moins en moins de salariés. Buggy whips were huge in Rochester, New York. And indeed, when automobiles took over, the buggy whip manufacturers closed shop. But what took over instead in Rochester was cameras. Kodak and Polaroid were headquartered there. And then there was this whole new world. Now, uh, Kodak had hundreds of thousands of employees, really good, solid, middle-class jobs. Kodak and Polaroid both went bankrupt. The new world of photography is Instagram, which had 13 employees and sold for a billion dollars to Facebook. Facebook is a giant public company controlled by one person. So what we're seeing is the use of digital networks to create intense, unbelievable, unprecedented concentrations of wealth within the market system, which is no longer the market system at all. It's something entirely different. It's a feudal system, and this is a great example of it. Buggy whips, cameras, Instagram. Employees, employees, no employees. We've created this 
engine of almost guaranteed concentration of wealth and power for whoever has the biggest computers, whoever is the most central position on networks. It's not a playing field, it's a funnel. And I think that what is happening is not simply more poverty, more inequality, more lack of opportunity. No, we're dealing with expulsions. At some point, more inequality is not simply more inequality. We need, it needs another name. People are being expelled from livelihoods. La grande interrogation de politique publique, c'est et si demain euh, toute l'économie est colonisée par le numérique, si l'essentiel du travail est fait par des par des utilisateurs non rémunérés, qui va nous payer et financer notre train de vie Et donc c'est ça l'enjeu de politique industrielle aujourd'hui, c'est prendre les gains de productivité générés par l'économie numérique et s'en servir pour faire émerger de nouveaux marchés sur lesquels se créeront les emplois de demain, qu'on ne connaît pas encore aujourd'hui. Et, et les assurances sociales, ce sont elles en, ré, en réalité qui, euh, qui permettent d'amortir le choc d'une révolution industrielle et d'accompagner l'économie dans l'allocation de ressources optimales qui permet de retrouver un nouvel équilibre et euh, au capital de s'investir là où vont se recréer des emplois. Finance is basically a utility. Finance does not manufacture anything you can touch or feel, doesn't market anything you can see. None of those are its products. It's a utility that's supposed to serve the rest of the economy. What we've done, and certainly what financial leaders want to do, is almost turn that on its head and make the economy be driven by finance. If the financial sector were really providing value to the rest of the economy, the, fin the financial sector may get wealthier, but the rest of the economy should grow too. Their share of the pie should be the same. But what's happened is their sh share of the pie has doubled to levels that are that's just almost unprecedented historically. One of the changes that's occurred is that at the end of the Second World War, the average time an investor held on to a share of stock was, was measured in years. And what's happened is that as the technology has advanced and practices have advanced, the average time of holding on to shares of stock first fell to an hour, then minutes. And more recently, it's been measured as the average holding period is 22 seconds. Many of the holding periods aren't measured in seconds at all. <laughs> They're measured in uh, thousandths of a second or a millionth of a second or a billionth of a second. And the turn is just like completely instantaneous. That activity is activity that has nothing to do with creating jobs for anybody other than the uh, people who work not too far from where we're speaking right now on Wall Street. We now have this extraordinary phenomenon called high-frequency trading. People who do high-frequency trading have to get their computers so close to the computers of the central stock exchange or whatever is the exchange that the fiber optics that they connect them will be able to buy and sell something in way less than a second less than a tenth of a second and of course at that level they can't possibly be making an informed judgment 
about what uh, that equity is worth. They are simply switching on computers that have what are called algorithms, rules of the game written into each other, and these are computers just chasing each other's round and round in circles. Now, I think there's a debate as to whether or not that does harm, but I think it's certainly useless. I don't think there's any social value. This is not making the allocation of capital more efficient. It's not usefully determining whether the savers of a pension fund give their money to this company or that company according to its products or its, uh, its entrepreneurial uh, uh, capabilities. That's the useful activity, but we often go beyond that to levels of activity which don't serve a useful purpose. Seventy percent of financial trading happens, and I'm quoting, in black pools. Now, you might think that black pools is the language of, you know, those of us who do work on the informal economy, on illegality, etc. No, that was Bernanke, the head of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. That means that the Federal Reserve is unable to really understand what exactly is happening there. What's really happening in the dark pools is people are trying to escape detection by some of these computers, these robots that are, that are trying to detect behavior before it actually occurs. So, so many things get affected, not just the securities markets, but fuel prices for uh, people who heat their homes and fill their cars food prices for people in developing countries. All of these things get affected, and that's, that's really problematic. Une partie des acteurs du monde de la finance, une partie des acteurs ont complètement perdu de vue les valeurs fondamentales, les principes essentiels du métier de la banque et de la finance. Le premier texte écrit Le code d'Amourabi à Babylone, on énonce quelques principes fondamentaux du métier de banquier. Par exemple, euh, il ne doit pas y avoir contradiction, conflit d'intérêt entre votre intérêt de banquier et celui de vos clients. Quand je reçois de l'argent d'une tierce personne, je dois gérer cet argent en bon père de famille. En bon père de famille, c'est écrit sur le code d'Amourabi. Et il faut reconstituer cette éthique des métiers de la finance, les valeurs fondamentales, les principes que ceux qui exercent cette activité doivent constamment garder à l'esprit parce que ils exercent une mission d'intérêt public. Finance is supposed to spread risk, manage risk, but instead finance has become the greatest source of risk. The financial sector has expanded boundlessly both in its size and its profitability while at the same time destroying the world's finances. I mean, it's, it's absolutely absurd. And yet we're all civilized, we're all nice as we should be. We respect the system we've all agreed to and we accept the benefits that have accrued to people who've participated in schemes that are mathematically absurd, just pure nonsense. Uh, but we cannot sustain it. It's simply impossible. We cannot continue. When we talk about Robinhood taxes or financial transaction taxes, we're talking about imposing the tax on only one small part of what the finance sector actually does. We're saying that trading that is, uh, trading assets back and forth should be taxed. If you are an investor and, and buy some stocks today and hold them for two years, five years, 10 years, whatever, um, you would pay a small fee going in and a small fee going out. But that would be trivial to you.
to tax every financial transaction. That has a single, nice, simple aim, a bit of redistribution. It doesn't kill the monster, but it tells the monster, you know, every time you do one of your monstrous activities, no matter how tiny, you redistribute a bit. Those transactions, because of the tax, will have to pay the tax, and, and, and so they won't be um, as profitable. You can, you'll cut back on those kinds of transactions. So the financial transaction tax will actually reduce risk in the economy and risk to the system to try to avoid another crash. By the way, I'm really scared. Another much bigger one that can't be stopped. The officer, Captain Herbie Johnson, had his people up there, and uh, fire got really nasty really quick, and there was a flashover, and Herbie and uh, one of his people were caught on the second floor, and uh, Herbie suffered some pretty bad injuries, and he didn't make it, so. Shortly after that, we got a visit on my shift from the mayor, and Mayor Emanuel came in, so he offered his condolences, and he also said that he had just come from speaking to Herbie Johnson's family again and to see how they were doing, to check in on them, see if they needed anything. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe it was a mayor's thing to do for him to come to us and do that. I thought it was a really classy gesture. Then he goes with that same demeanor and says, now I want to talk about your pensions. So right away, right away the alarm bells are going off in my head because he used to come around. He was coming around to the firehouses before he got elected when he was campaigning talking about the same issue. And uh, what he would tell us is, there's no easy choices. Your pension is badly underfunded. If you guys want to have something going forward, we're going to have to make some tough choices to make sure that you do. We don't take care of the inherited past, be honest with our employees, be honest with our taxpayers. We're going to be stealing from our future, and that's just the wrong course to do. So I don't know what possessed me. I guess I'm sometimes a troublemaker once in a while. So I sort of raised my hand, and I said, you know, I've got an idea. While well, our pension fund has been suffering and people have been losing their homes, uh, we know there's one sector of our economy that's doing pretty well because we bailed them out. It's the banks, it's the investors. If we were to institute a tiny financial transaction tax on the Board of Trade and the Mercantile Exchange, we could recoup some of these losses and we'll be getting it back from the people who squandered it in the first place. They won't notice it's missing. It'll, it could just be a tiny tax, and you could just bring in tremendous amounts of revenue and solve some of these budget crises. And he said, I don't support that. If you go down to Springfield, our state capital, you won't find any legislators who support that. If you think it's a good idea, you should run for office. The important thing, I think, the, with, the, with the financial transaction tax to me, is it's not just practical, it's also symbolic. It's saying, look, we are not going to let you, investors, bankers, do whatever you want and cause all this damage to all these people who you see as, I know, beneath you are not as important. If there's some value in what you do, you'll do it with a smaller profit margin. You'll do it and pay more taxes. And if there's no value in what you do, you know what, we're going to make it illegal. But until we figure that out, you're going to pay whatever we decide you're going to pay to help recoup some of this loss that you've created, to help repair some of this damage that you've caused. But I think if we, but we have to change our thinking though, as, as, a, as a society in general. Do you want to put another coat of paint on the bond trader's boat? Or do you want to make sure your firefighter has a pension to, to go to when he retires? Take your pick. It's an easy choice as far as I'm concerned. 
the financial transactions tax at a time when we're struggling to get our economies growing is quite simply madness. That is why Britain has been arguing for a pro-business agenda in Europe. The Griffin, it's, it's present as a, as, a, as a symbol of the city at the gates of the city, so you can see it all around the square mile. But it's more than simply a, a symbol. It seems to, in my mind, express something of the spirit of the city. And I experience that spirit as demonic because it's the only way that I can understand how this system works. Because Individually, the people in the city are good people. They're not bad people. But there is within this system something at work that causes us to uh, exploit the world's resources, that is causing us to act against our own interests. Now, of course, it is right that the financial sector should pay their share. But if you look at the European Commission's own original analysis, that showed that a financial transactions tax could cost the GDP of the European Union and could reduce it by 200 billion euros. It could cost almost 500,000 jobs. I could imagine that if it produces somewhat less financial activity, there might be, at the end of the day, somewhat less people employed in the financial services industry across the world. But I'm a sufficient believer in the dynamism of capitalism that they'd find other jobs to do. And I actually think that the, we are overproducing financial services and we'd probably find better jobs for them to do. I mean, again, it comes back to the uh, French attitude. If you charge people 75% rate of income tax, aren't we going to have a lot more money? No, because people will stop paying it because they'll either move away from it or they'll devise ways of avoiding it. Um, so, and of course, it is only in the West, so most of the trade will move to, to Asia with no intention, I can tell you, of putting on any form of transaction tax. Um, there's a couple of problems with that. One, South Korea has a financial transaction tax. Taiwan has a financial transaction tax. Singapore has a financial transaction tax, as do several of the smaller markets. Those who are against it, who just don't like it, what they do is they try to persuade enough countries to be against it that they can then say, oh, well, there's no point in the rest having it because it will move to those against it. The city of London guards its freedom to do exactly as it wants jealously. Um, it's not going to sign up to anything that's going to impose a tax, however small, um, on the vast volume of money that passes through the city every day. Um, it's not so much because they would lose huge amounts of money. There's so much money in the system, I doubt they would even notice it. I think their resistance is more because it smacks of the beginning of the possibility of a global tax regime. <laughs> We're celebrating the spirit of the Occupy movement and the nurses globally from 16 countries are bringing the same message to their governments that we want to end austerity measures and pass the Robin Hood tax. People used to, in their positions, use that money to invest, to invest in our country, to invest in people, and they're not doing it anymore. We saw that with the banks. They're just hoarding it. And as a nurse, I would say they're probably a little bit mentally ill. It's not normal to want to hoard all that money. It's more than you could use in a lifetime. And the people in this country need it. They're on a planet with other people. They're in a country with other people. And that money needs to be put to good use. We pay sales tax on everything we buy. We're used to doing that. And we, if we have to pay sales tax on food and items of clothing and the things that we use every day, they should be paying a sales tax too. And that's what we're asking. And this is revenue that would come in each year from the private sector into the public sector and the impact that it actually will have on our economy is enormous so that's one of the idea that's one of the reasons why people like bill gates warren buffett george soros all of whom are certainly no you know left-wing liberal have all supported the robin hood tax <laughs> I grew up in the segregated South of the 1950s, and I saw the kinds of inequality there, and that angered me. 
And now when I look at what's happened, not just in the U.S., but in a lot of wealthy countries over the last, particularly the last 30 to 35 years, and see the huge shift of income upwards to mostly 1% of the population, in which, by the way, financial employees are overrepresented in that 1% very significantly. When I see that, I think that level of inequality is not justified, but it also doesn't, doesn't build the economy over the long run for the rest of us. And so this is a tax that, as we like to say in the Robin tax movement, is not a tax on the people, it's a tax for the people. There's not a problem with coming up with technical solutions to these problems that we've identified. It's a political problem. It's an organizing problem. It's a problem that the major parties have been captured by this global haven industry and the multinational companies that uh, you know, it represents uh, and the wealthy individuals that it represents. Uh, and left to their own devices, those parties will not step forward uh, and advocate these kinds of reforms. We need to put pressure on them. La question des paradis fiscaux est aussi importante du point de vue politique que ne l'est la question des euh, variations climatiques du point de vue euh, des écosystèmes. C'est un combat à long terme. Peut-être que de notre vivant, on n'en verra pas la fin. Mais il reste que, euh, d'ores et déjà, euh, les peuples doivent, je pense, réapprendre à se donner des institutions qui leur ressemblent. Des institutions qui leur ressemblent et qui sont la médiatisation de leur volonté en tant que Que, que corps public. So arguably, although the foundations of the fiscal state have certainly been eroded by offshore finance, the fact that we now know about it means that perhaps we have the possibility of a greater democratic handle on it. This is something that now affects individuals. Until 2008, perhaps we didn't see it so clearly. What the bankers do has direct consequences for every individual, and we can now see that. The reason, in fact, that the tax justice network and the tax justice movement in general are growing as a worldwide phenomenon is because, precisely because this experiment we ran with liberalization of markets didn't work. I mean, we don't have a welfare state anymore. We've had 30 years of dismantling it. Il y a un risque euh, si on n'est pas capable de recréer euh, des règles du jeu, de les faire respecter, de rétablir la transparence et la confiance des citoyens. Il y a un risque qu'un jour les citoyens disent « puisque ça ne marche pas, ça, puisque la démocratie ne marche pas, eh bien on va choisir autre chose ». And in Europe, we can talk about you know, the corporate state, and it has another name, and that is fascism. And fascism is stalking the streets of Europe. Once again, you can see it on the streets now in countries which are failing. And that in many cases, they're failing because the governments, like the Greek government of Greece, was incapable of taxing effectively. In an era of globalized capital markets, you can't preserve national sovereignty without a framework for international cooperation. International law has to change, and these companies need to be held accountable for tax law, tax evasion, no matter what country they're in. And I think it's just like like other things, like human rights abuses, you know, like work standards worldwide, like this stuff has to become globalized. It's a joke to think that, you know, these countries are going to be held accountable by one certain nation's laws on tax. Like, it has to be a global thing, and it really has to evolve to that point, I think. La mondialisation sans réelle coopération et coordination fiscale entre les pays est une erreur de parcours qui va être jugée importante avec le temps. Et quoi qu'on fasse, il faut toujours protéger le principe de la juste part d'impôts si durement acquis au fil des siècles, parce que lorsqu'on s'en éloigne, c'est la démocratie qu'on met en péril. In the case of, uh, uh, 
political power, we not only see this enormous concentration of wealth beyond the realm of taxation, but the reverse side of that is increased representation without taxation for those interests. And so they have the best of both worlds, um, you know, citizens of nowhere for tax purposes and super representation uh, without taxation. You know, and that's just not uh, a solution we can live with. At the end of the day, this is the tax haven, the offshore system is a project of the world's wealthiest and most powerful people. And they will always be pushing for this system to exist and the, the, the challenge is to get the people to sort of push back against that and to understand how it's happening and to, to know how to push back. Thank you.